Before we start, if you're enjoying these conversations, please make sure that you like or subscribe to Cleaning Up. It really helps other people to find us. Cleaning Up is brought to you by the Liebreich Foundation and the Gilardini Foundation. Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich and this is Cleaning Up. My guest today is Professor Emily Shuckborough. She's a mathematician and a climate scientist. She's a member of the British Antarctic Survey and she's the director of Cambridge Zero, that's Cambridge University's Climate Change Initiative. Please welcome Emily Shuckborough to Cleaning Up. So, Emily, welcome to Cleaning Up. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure. Now, we have managed not to meet properly over the years until last month, where we took part in a seminar, the Christ's College Climate Seminar, and, uh, and we finally met. Um, and I'm a, I'm a Christ's alumnus, so I'm a, I'm a Cambridge alumnus, and that, I believe, is where you are today. Uh, well, in Cambridge, not in Christ's Cambridge. College, but in Cambridge, yes. And unfortunately, we didn't meet in person, though. It was We met virtually at the Christ's uh, Climate Seminar. That's right. So I start. I, I, I feel that I know you very well, and that we've almost worked together. So we still have never actually met. But um, I also discovered preparing for this conversation uh, something about you, which I would have been much, much more intimidated doing that seminar with you had I known. Which is that you are the co-author of the Ladybird Climate, the uh, Ladybird book on climate science, uh, along with um, H R H Prince Charles and Tony Juniper. It's true. It's true. Yes. So, so never mind all the other publications and citations that you've got <laughs> as a scientist. That is the one that really intimidates me. Really? Oh, it was immense. Um, it was immense fun, actually, to, to put together. But it was in terms of science communication, it was probably the most difficult thing because what we were trying to do was effectively condense down the whole of the IPCC reports um, into a Ladybird book. So we had you know, just a couple of hundred page uh, words to describe each super difficult concept um, in a language. It, it wasn't th that particular version um, wasn't really aimed at children. It was aimed at an adult audience, but in the format of a Ladybird book. So it, it had to be um, incredibly clear what each of the concepts we were trying to get over. And it took us for ever <laughs> to really distill down that information in you know in, in a simpler way as we could well i can imagine i'm not sure if everybody perhaps we've got you know listeners around the world may not know what a ladybird oh, book is i've got it here um, look there, there it is you, there you go so you can see it's quite a slim so, volume and these are play an iconic role in most certainly british children i think uh, children in the commonwealth absolutely. um so know, in their childhood the thing that it looks like right and, and every page does, has a picture and I love the blurb because it says you'll learn about the causes and consequences of climate disruption, heat waves, floods and other extreme weather, disappearing wildlife, acid oceans, the benefits of limiting warming, sustainable farming, new clean technologies and the circular economy. And, you know, I spent I've spent 20 years and I still don't know anything about new clean technology. So I am actually expecting a copy of that book signed uh, hopefully by all three authors uh, after this um, episode. You can do. And you know what? We are actually just, so we wrote it a couple of, uh, what was it? Probably about five years ago now, maybe 20, even longer. 2017. Fact, I, know how, I, know, 2017. I know when it was because we actually, most of the writing was done by um, Tony Juniper and myself around my kitchen table with what my, with my, what now is um, eldest child. No, it must've been the second one running around the floor as a baby. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> anyway, there we go. But we know the point is we're just about we're just in the process. This may be top secret, I don't know. But anyway, if it is, you heard it first here um, of doing a new version, which is for children. Um, so we're going to condense it down even further um, to uh, to do a children's version of a ladybird book. Do you know that I actually had considered doing a children's version or children's climate book because I've got um, children who are 10, 11, 12. And it's really hard for them to cut through. Uh, I think we're probably going to come back and talk about, you know, some of the um, difficulties and, you know, are stories exaggerated? And if they, uh, if they are, is it appropriate um, for children to sort of depress them and scare them with this stuff and so on? And so I was thinking of doing a version which, which I would feel comfortable with my children reading, but maybe I'll just use yours. 
I want to. If Actually, I can... no, but before we move on from that, that that is the other thing that we did with this. So this is the only Ladybird book ever to have been published that's been peer reviewed. <laughs> so because I, you know, coming from the science perspective, I really wanted to make sure that every single, you know, word in the book was referenced through to the published literature, and then we put it through, a, you know, the normal full peer review process. I think Ladybird thought we were completely mad, but it was because we wanted to have that, you know, same level of quality, but just in. A different format Thank i think you. that's absolutely fantastic and it is actually the perfect segue into what i was about to say we should talk about which is your career as a mathematician and an academic because um you you've won your obe for services to climate climate or science communication but actually you, you, absolutely you you are a um <laughs> i'm i'm gonna wave there to uh, is that your eldest? What's the eldest? Do you want to see the other one while we're in it? On. Well, I mean, we uh, yeah, <laughs> we might as well, absolutely. <laughs> Sorry. First, I... Now, we, this, most of our audience are actually, they listen via podcast. So they won't have a clue what we're talking about there. But uh, for oh. our podcast listeners, <laughs> there are two very lovely small children wandering around in the background, waving and looking incredibly cute. Um, but you started actually not as an environmentalist or an environmental sciences person, but as a mathematician. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. That's absolutely right. So um, I, uh, I was an undergraduate studying mathematics. And when I finished my undergraduate studies, I was wondering what to do <laughs> afterwards. Um, and I really wanted to see how I could use mathematics actually just to better understand the world you know to, to actually you you know math, math, mathematics can be a very theoretical subject and actually the beauty you know for a mathematician there's a lot the beauty of the theoretical aspect of it is very compelling but I also wanted to see how that um, mathematics could be used to understand the world and when I first started getting into the climate area frankly it was just at the start of when it was you know, becoming a topic of political importance, if you like. Um, it was just when the first IPCC report had come out. So, you know, re really my motivations weren't the sort of saving the world motivations. They were more just um, a desire to understand the world more than anything else. And so you got into climate modelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, my, so I started off and actually it was even the very first topic that I was... Um, applying the mathematics to was actually um, a slightly different environmental problem. So it was actually more focused on ozone and ozone depletion. Because um, from a mathematical perspective, um, the uh, well, both the atmosphere and the oceans, they're, they're fluids from a mathematical perspective. And, you know, to understand um, how they um, uh, uh, you know any aspect of the of the physics of the atmosphere and oceans you need to understand how fluids move around and for the ozone hole um, there was a really well there is a really interesting interaction between the movement of the air in the atmosphere and the chemistry of the atmosphere so the hole itself that you have in terms of the ozone hole um, it primarily over Antarctica and what happens is that um, in the winter, in particular in Antarctica, you get these incredibly strong winds that circulate high up in the atmosphere, in the stratosphere um, around Antarctica and isolate the air. And that's actually down to the physics because it's predominantly those winds are a result of the very strong temperature gradient that you have in winter between the pole and the equator. Um, so the air gets isolated, but it gets chemically isolated as well, because it's literally in this vortex. Um, and that um, enables um, chemical reactions to occur that essentially take the chlorine out of what was, you know, there was the, the aerosol spray cans or refrigerants that were the CFCs that the, the problem. They take the, the chlorine out of, um, uh, of the air and that's. Um, chemical reaction happens on the surface of clouds. There's so much, so many really fascinating elements of it. It's one of these systems that all comes together. But then to destroy the ozone, um, you have to, ha it's a photochemical reaction. So it doesn't happen in winter. You just get the kind of chemicals stored up in winter. And then it, the sunlight returns in spring and those chemicals then destroy the ozone. So it's a really fascinating interplay between different parts of the system. So that's the aspect that I was originally looking at. 
And then from there, I started to move into looking at, at uh, climate related problems. But it's, that's a great sort of um, vignette of just how complex these models yeah. are, because that interaction I'm going through, and I have a, a, enough of a scientific background to understand kind of how complicated and how many terms, and how many different things, how many variables you've got interacting. And that is just, you know, in a sense, that's just, air quotes, ozone. But when you get these big um, models of the, the whole sort of geophysics of the planet, you get into climate modeling, um, I guess, I suppose I'll turn it into a question. You know, do you worry that we are, you know, that, 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 that we're sort of incredibly good at certain, you know, pieces of that model, but because we can't do some types of clouds or we can't do some types of interactions, that actually what we're producing, um, you know, we've, we've sort of got five decimal places of accuracy about part of a model, but actually no decimal places of accuracy or, or only one about the overall outcomes. Um, that, that can certainly be true. In a way, I think that actually the way that, I mean, this is where it's really um, helpful, I think, to be coming from a more mathematical background, um, because actually there's no, from looking at it from a mathematical perspective, it's not one model. There's a kind of hierarchy of different models. And actually many times, um, you know, the mathematical insight will be about actually not the sort of super all singing, all dancing, throw it all in model with every, you know, trying to model every different part of the system. It's a, it would be about extracting information for uh, 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 that has much less complexity to it, but potentially greater, greater insight. Um, or it's about understanding which aspects of that incredibly complex system are highly uncertain um, and which aspects are the really robust elements of the of the problem so we, it's almost a slightly different lens to look at the at the problem uh, the problem through um, so, I mean actually one of my current bits of research that um, we're focused on is how to take a slightly different approach so traditionally the modeling approaches I mean in climate have very much come out of weather forecasting. I mean, the original models of the atmosphere came out of attempting to forecast the weather. And then slowly those climate models have developed as we've added, for the purposes of modeling climate, more components of the Earth system. So first of all, you started off with just the atmosphere-based models, You were then simple oceans and more complicated oceans were added in, then some of the atmospheric chemistry, etc. cetera. Um, and the models have become more and more complex as we've been able to model more and more aspects of the climate system, both in terms of our understanding of the physics, but also the amount of computer power that we've had that we've been able to um, uh, that we've been able to dedicate um, to that. But um, and and predominantly, the way that those climate models have been developed, you know, from, right from those weather forecast models, was by looking at how we could represent our understanding of the physics. Um, in terms of equations, and then those would get uh, uh, discretized and then uh, uh, simulated uh, using the computer models. What we're trying to do now is blend that with more data-driven approaches. And so we're looking at how we can bring in AI, machine learning approaches to augment those physics-based models with data-driven models as well. And that's where the kind of cutting edge of, the, uh, of much of the model development is at the moment. But that's that's really fascinating. So what you're saying is that sort of the physics models, well, they'll do their thing, but they might, but they may not be fully calibrated in a sense against. They're limited you know, by, the, in a sense, they're limited by our understanding of the physics. So if so, there may be. I mean, this is the whole thing about you know machine learning and AI is that there may be that actually the data <laughs> holds more within it than we can obviously immediately see, and if we can incorporate that into the models as well, um, and the scale of data that we have um, now available to us, and not least data from from remote sensing from satellite, is so enormous um, that you know. It's it's a to date it's been largely an overlooked resource in terms of the of the climate modeling. So we're looking to see how we can incorporate. I, it. So I think I've understood it. So what you're saying is, if we've got some data that shows when A happens and B and C and D and E, then we always get some G. We may not know why, but we can still use that in future to to get a, a more ac accurate uh, prognosis. 
Yeah, and and the key, and the key thing about climate is that um, so of course the 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 um, the thing that defines cl- uh, the reason for us wanting to predict future climate is precisely because we're in a state where the climate of yesterday is not a good predictor of the climate for tomorrow, right? right. So you might say, well, what you know, how can you possibly do this if you're using data from the past? Um, and that's why you can't throw out the physics because it's actually a combination of the two. You know, you want to have information about how certain parts of the climate system respond that you can achieve from the data, but you also want to have the physics that tells us how the system is changing over time as a consequence of, you know, changed what we would call forcings, changed, um, in, you know, atmospheric concentrations of, of greenhouse gases and so forth. Right. But there's a fantastic rabbit hole that I'd like to just kind of visit yes. briefly, <laughs> which is about these physics models yeah. that actually don't produce the average temperature that is observed. Right. They all <laughs> run either hot or cold. I will almost guarantee I'll guarantee that almost none of the audience knows this, that you've got these okay. incredible models with incredible complexity and all these different uh, physical laws and everything. We, we know so much about uh, radiation of heat and what happens at different temperatures and how the oceans move around and blah. And we've done, you know, decades, many decades now of modeling. And then you say, so model, what temperature will the planet on average be? And it comes out with a number which is like a degree out which is a huge delta. And then what they do is hide that by only ever talking about differences from baseline. So if we pump out this many emissions, then the temperature will go out by up by, you know, 0.324 degrees. And it's like, yes, but your baseline could be out by a whole degree. Is that is that fair? Well, it's sort of, I mean, it, it, well, it's true that, um, and so you all, we, uh, if we compare models or compare models with observations, you, you will always see the anomalies, the differences compared to the mean condition um, plotted for that reason. I mean, it is something where you can, um, you can either do that or you could tune things in the model, you know, you could change slightly the amount of, uh, you know, the radiation coming in from the sun or something right. that would also T- change Tuning, that. otherwise, um, no, otherwise but, known as fiddling in my world. Yeah. Yeah. Again, from the mathematical perspective, the uh, I mean, it we really frequently separate out these two things. So you, we really frequently separate out, uh, you know, aspects of the mean conditions and aspects of the variation because you know the two are predicted differently. So it's from a mathematical right. p- perspective, we would see no, 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 no challenge with doing doing right. that. So just to be clear for the audience, what that means is that there is some very good maths that says that even if your baseline is out by a bit, that the anomalies, the changes can actually be very well represented. <laughs> I mean, I do worry about whether that's also true around zero because water does things like freeze and thaw and all those. So I, I, there is a part of me that goes, hmm, that's a bit of a, you know, I'd, I'd love to have more time to probe that, but it is a <laughs> bit of a rabbit hole. But sorry, you were, you were going to continue. <laughs> I don't know what I was going to continue with. <laughs> you, were, you were saying it was justified and I was translating. I was passing that for the audience right. saying, yeah, I can well, there kind you go. Of buy it's that. justified. It's justified. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's justified. OK, so the models aren't very accurate, but they're justified and they're getting better. And there's no and the anomalies they deal with really, really well. Uh, that's right. And, you know, no model is perfect. Right. And and, and it's really important to, to recognize that no model is is perfect, but they give us really valuable insight. And I, I mean, you know, we. Again, that, his, that history of the connection with weather forecast models, I mean, that's one area where we've really been able to see how progress over, you know, the last decades has really translated into predictive power. You know, we had a big storm in the UK at the end of last week that was predicted days in advance in a way that you roll back 20 years and it certainly wouldn't have been. Um, and that's all down to the way in which these models have grown in terms of their fidelity, in terms of how accurate their forecasts are. And just to be clear, what um, if you sort of fast forward, that's how you got into the modeling. Yeah. Uh, fast forward to today, are you still able to do any of that? Or are you too busy writing la- ladybird books and, uh, and, and uh, running Cambridge's climate change uh, activities? Um, so I currently have or co-supervise seven PhD students. So I have a lot of PhD students who are, I mean, m- me, myself, do I get involved in writing computer code um not so much any longer um but uh, but i have a large number of students okay very good now i do want to i want to back up to a particular time though because uh, i want to i want to dive into the antarctic so mm-hmm. you um you joined the british antarctic survey in 2006 and yep. you led 
uh, it's one of one of the most um, uh, strangled acronyms that I've come across. The <laughs> Ocean Regulation of Climate by Heat and Carbon Sequestration and Transports, otherwise known as Orchestra. Yeah, I didn't come up with that name. Right. <laughs> but, but you led that, and then you became um, head of the Open Oceans 2009, deputy head of Polar Oceans in 2015. You're a fellow of the Royal Antarctic Survey. So, so I guess what everybody will want to know is, how 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 much time did you spend in Antarctica? I mean, this is the coolest thing ever, right? <laughs> um, so Liter- in total, literally, yeah, it is. <laughs> um, in total, I did um, five polar trips: three to the Arctic and two to the Antarctic. Um, and so the um, first trip I ever did was to the Arctic, and that was um, uh, looking. Well, was when I was working on the ozone problem. Um, and so it was looking at the uh, ozone, it was a much smaller ozone hole that exists over the Arctic than, than the Antarctic. Um, and that was my very first polar trip. And then I did two trips to Antarctica. And my Antarctic trips, I was primarily, as you just described, my focus of research at that time was the oceans and understanding the ocean around Antarctica. So my um, main purpose of my research was to study the oceans. We were taking measurements in the oceans. And um, when I was actually on Antarctica, stepping foot on, I was slave labor basically. Cause so we would stop at, <laughs> so we would go by, sh- no, we would take the research ship. We'd be doing all the science um, in the Southern ocean, particularly in the Drake Passage region. And then um, the main British research base is Rothera, which is on the Antarctic Peninsula. So then the ship would go down the Antarctic Peninsula um, to Rothera, where we'd be dropping off people and supplies to the to the research base there. And and as I say, we were we were basically the slave slave labour at that point. <laughs> at that, so that point, point you like lugging boxes when you say slave labour. Well, no, or... literally, yes, no. I mean, yeah. you know, first task is unload the ship, and so I mean, if you're on the, you know, if you're doing science on the, you know, you get you do everything from cleaning the toilets to unloading the ship. Um, so everyone everyone mocks in together. And uh, you know, I have. And we did do, actually. I tell you what, the other thing that we, the, my, my main kind of touristic thing from um, from that trip that I remember more than anything um, was uh, doing some uh, midnight. But it was we go in Antarctic summer mostly, um, so it was still complete daylight. Um, midnight skiing down downhill skiing. So they take a little snow cat up and we ski down yeah. <laughs> in so, Antarctica. I mean, now you're talking my language. What's, <laughs> what's the scheme? Like how many how many pieces are there? How many lifts? Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> there's a small at the back of the base. There's a small hillock that you and, can and see there. Did, did you do? Apparently, the sort of the, the 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 thing that the real pros do is is they overwinter. Did you yes. do the winter in Antarctica? No, I did not. No, you're absolutely right. Unless you, you know, it doesn't properly count with going to Antarctica unless you overwinter. But actually, only quite a small number of scientists overwinter. Um, it depends on, you know, exactly what kind of research you, you do. But the bases, I mean, our main base, Rothera, in summer can have a couple of hundred people on the base. And in winter, it goes down to a really a skeleton, a skeleton number of people um, on that base. So many fewer people. But that, that's, that's, it only counts, you know, really properly if you if you if you're in winter. There was actually, but the, per, the person I first went up to the Arctic with um, was from British Antarctic Survey, um, Joe Farmer, and he was one of the people who originally discovered the the ozone hole. And he um, had at the time done fourteen overwinters in in, in Antarctica. <laughs> and when we went up to the um, to the Arctic together. Um, Again, you know, as a sort of extracurricular activity, skiing was involved, but cross-country skiing. And, uh, you know, if you've done 14 overwinters in the Antarctic, you are a very good cross-country skier, <laughs> I can tell you. And I was left long behind as uh, this. I mean, Joe must have been easily in his 70s by that point. Um, and uh, he was whizzing off into the distance and I was left a long way behind. So I, I'm hoping that there are some you know, sort of uh, some students, maybe even some kids listening that were like, oh, you know, I want to be like her. I want to do those things. That's my goal. Because, of course, the closest I've ever got to uh, Antarctica is reading uh, about Shackleton, um, which <laughs> that hasn't got quite the same sort of, uh, you can't put that on your resume, really. Um, yeah. I mean, li- listen, the, the research, I mean, even on the ship, go, you know, the, the Great Passage um, 
uh, research. I mean, A, A, it's an amazing experience going across straight passage. Um, you have to uh, be prepared to get quite seasick because at times we would have, you know, 10 meter waves and you'd have to stop doing the science because the ships, you know, even a big research ship is rocking about too much at that point to be able to put the instruments over the side of the ship. Um, the wildlife is incredible. So the, um, particularly the, the, many of the, the whales, I think they like the, the sound of the, they think it's a friend or something when we put the instrument into the water and it pings um yeah, you know often whales come to to investigate what's going on um albatross are incredible um penguins coming hopping along behind the ship so it's you know amazing from that perspective and actually the first sight of antarctica when you see these the icebergs that you first see are not like the sort of icebergs that you imagine instead they're these huge cliffs of ice, of tabular ice sheets. Um, so it is absolutely incredible. But the science is, you know, is, is really amazing as well, especially, you know, I'm a mathematician. I come from a theoretical background. And um, to actually go and do fieldwork is, I think, incredibly important from somebody from a mathematical or modeling background, because you get insight by seeing things, you know, actually, you know, in real life that you wouldn't do otherwise. You see, you know, you understand some of the uncertainties on the data in a way that you wouldn't do if you weren't actually involved in taking those those measurements. Um, so I think it's it, it's an amazing experience, and you know, you do feel incredibly privileged to be doing science in a place like Antarctica. But it's also um, absolutely fascinating. But I couldn't agree more with the need, even for the theoretical modelers, to get out there and actually see the thing they're modeling. Yeah. Um, I mean, just from my own area, which is more about you know energy and transport analysis, but actually um, going and standing next to a big wind turbine or climbing up one of the towers or seeing the size of an offshore wind turbine nacelle or going down. Um, I was very privileged when I was on the board of transport for London to go down into the uh, crossrail tunnels where they were building it and just seeing what goes on behind the scenes. You just have a different relationship with, you know, your analysis or your writing on, you know, subject X when you've been up close and personal. So I, I agree with that totally. If we talk about, though, the results of all of that research, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to get a sort of clean signal with uncertainty bands on what is happening in, I'm, I'm thinking particularly Antarctic. I mean, Arctic, we know it's floating ice. We know that when it melts, the, uh, the albedo, the, uh, the brightness reduces, and so it's a feedback mechanism. Uh, and we've talked about some of these things with Johan Rockström, um, mm -hmm who came and talked us through some of the planetary boundaries work in an earlier episode. But if we go to Antarctic, you know, you'll get everything from, um, you know, these stories about the breakup of a, of, a of a glacier and we should all sort of start buying property on the high ground and buying shotguns and bottled water and, uh, you know, get all the way through to, you know, ha, 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 that research ship got caught in ice. There isn't supposed to be any ice anymore and it's all a hoax and there's nothing going on. And you get these kind of two extremes. So first of all, could you tell us what is what is the impact of climate change on Antarctic kind of today and how it plays out, in a sense, what's the what's the what's your current best description of that? And and we know that there are uncertainties, of course. Yeah. So okay. So the first thing is that it's important, to, and you you have to distinguish between two different types of ice because they sometimes get confused. So there's the sea ice, um, uh, which is floating ice on the sea that forms, you know, uh, when the when the seawater freezes. And then there's the ice shelf and ice sheet. So the, the, the ice sheet of Antarctica that then goes down and, and creates an ice shelf. Um, and those, uh, the, you know, they, those are distinct, physically different types of, uh, of ice. Um, in terms of the ice um, sheets in, in, in Antarctica, the, the one... I mean, the whole of the whole of Antarctica obviously is covered in in ice, but the component of it that we are most concerned about is the western side of Antarctica, um, what we call the West Antarctic ice sheet. And the reason that we are particularly concerned about that is because um, we've seen significant loss of ice from that 
West Antarctic ice sheet. And in particular, there are the ice sheet itself has glaciers. You know, it's made up of glaciers. They're they're sort of you know almost like the spinal system of the of the ice sheet itself. And um, we are you know we believe that there's a number of the glaciers that are critical to the stability of the West Antarctic ice sheet that are potentially already in irreversible retreat. And um, so the, uh, to an extent, the ice sheet is melting from above as the, as the um, air is warming, but that, you know, Antarctica is so cold that that's not a particularly significant um, aspect. The key aspect is really that the oceans around Antarctica, the Southern Ocean is warming up. And then that warmer ocean water is getting underneath the ice shelf and melting it from below. So that's the key mechanism. And so and, and, and the concern is that as those um, glaciers start to retreat, um, two things happen. First of all, more ice, the glaciers, as they, it sounds a bit counterintuitive, but as they start to retreat, they're always shooting ice off into the sea, but they can accelerate as they start to retreat. So more ice actually comes from Antarctica into the, um, into the ocean. Um, uh, but also the whole system can eventually disintegrate. And there are key instabilities um, uh, that can occur that, you know, accelerate that process. Um, and there's a huge amount of ice, I mean, 60 meters or so locked up in the in a sea level equivalent, um, locked up in the Antarctic ice sheet altogether. But that Western, the bit that's potentially vulnerable in that Western, um, West Antarctic ice shelf, something around three meters of sea level rise equivalent. Um, and we, you know, if that process started and that, you know, of the, of the eventual destruction, we don't really know how long it would take. I mean, it's probably centuries, so it's probably not something that you need to worry about tomorrow, but we don't really know and we don't have a good understanding of all those processes, all those instabilities that might speed th speed that up. Um, and so there's been a big concerted research effort over the last few years to go to what is an incredibly remote part of Antarctica to study um, that West Antarctic ice sheet, and in particular, those key glaciers, the Thwaites Glacier, Pine Island Glacier, um, to understand it, you know, all the critical processes. And it comes down to you know, issues like how does the um, ice um, move against the bedrock and what's the frictional processes associated with that and exactly what is what form does the bedrock take because you know, it's, you know in places there are critical bumps in the bedrock that you know, the water the ocean water would need to get over to then melt the rest of the ice shelf but if it's sloping downwards into Antarctica if that then happens you can get a process that it then just self-reinforcing process and that's how you start to get um this really rapid acceleration so there's lots of details that are important but it is a genuine concern and the other piece of evidence that we have that's really pertinent to this is understanding what's happened in the past when the world has been you know not much warmer than today and we can ask the question whether or not that west antarctic ice sheet has been in intact in the past because if it hasn't um then we're in trouble or at least in trouble you know eventually and there's all sorts of um evidence that we can use to understand where that ice sheet has been in the past not least looking actually at the bedrock and seeing you can see the sort of ground the the the, the lines that are carved out in the bedrock for where that um ice sheet has been in the past and there's there's significant evidence that in warmer periods in the past the ice sheet hasn't been there and sea levels, global sea levels have been many meters higher. But, okay, so let, let me just um, try and pass some of that because mm -hmm. I want to make sure that people have kept up with the sheets and yes, the, you've got sorry. your sheets and your shelves and your, yeah. you know, so, um, so you've got, because you, you, I think you- Oh, and using, I didn't even mention the sea ice yet, but I'll come back to that. <laughs> right, because I, that's what I kind of want to get the basic anatomy here. And I'm doing this, for those who are listening on the podcast, I'm doing this and so are you in sort of interpretive dance. Yeah, so it's a lot sorry. easier to follow this on the on the YouTube channel. <laughs> well, when I say a lot easier, I say maybe a little bit easier. So, but you've got, so the ice sheet is the thing that blankets the whole of Antarctic. Mm -hmm. That's the thing yeah. that's like, 3,000 meters thick and it's got mountains under it and we're starting to probe and find out where those mountains are. And that's the ice uh, sheet. 
And then you've got these um, glaciers, which are like tongues, or you call it the spinal columns that kind of go down from that into, through valleys and they go out and they hit the coast. And at that point, you've got an ice shelf. shelf and it's floating on, you know, it comes out over the water. comes out and it's constantly on the move because it's going down from the higher levels and it's coming. So it's constantly on the move. And then it will have floating ice potentially beyond that that's on the on the ocean surface or is, is yeah is so that... and then we have the sea ice that's sea you know, ice seasonally, right. seasonally formed that's in you know the sea so that's that's frozen seawater as opposed to ice that's come down right from and it's the sea ice that goes up and down and in and out and the, and that that some people say ha ha it's getting bigger yes. and so therefore and there's no yes. problem and it's all com- virtually irrelevant um, well but, but it's useful to understand why the sea ice is irrelevant because the sea ice is melting massively in the arctic and you know we've seen this vast loss of sea ice in the arctic so why haven't we been seeing that in the in the antarctic and why in some place you know as you say ships get stuck in the ice and actually sometimes good, our research ships find it difficult good, to get good in. question why yes. haven't we seen it in the antarctic <laughs> i know somebody i can ask emily <laughs> well so the thing is but Antarctica's pretty cold. <laughs> Even with global warming, Antarctica is still pretty cold. And um, the other thing that's really important is the winds in Antarctica. If you've ever been to Antarctica, it's very windy. In fact, it's not only the coldest, it's also the windiest part <laughs> place in the world. And so what the key thing in Antarctica is literally um, that the depending on where the wind patterns are, the sea ice gets blown around. And um, you can have, and when um, if you um, essentially, you can get a sort of sea ice factory generated because the wind will blow the sea ice away, creating open ocean surface, more sea ice forms and you know, et cetera. So not only is the sea ice compacted by the wind in certain areas and not in other areas, so it gets blown, shifted around, but also you can generate these kind of essentially sea ice factories as well. So un, um, it's just a completely different um system in terms of the physics to the to the arctic right um, so, back to, so back to sheets and shelves i think you yep. talked about then you've got this warm water that can get potentially underneath the shelf and yep. then and then you know it, if that starts to carve and it starts to start then things can start to flow more quickly but here we go you see i'm i'm going to come back to how quickly this might be happening and you said we don't really know so you may have already answered yep. it but you know if i look at um december last year there were these headlines um, and um, the best one, my favorite was Rolling Stone magazine, that, you know, un, non peer reviewed journal, not even as good as a ladybird book in terms of peer review, but it says the fuse has been blown and the doomsday glacier is coming for us all. <laughs> right now that would make it sound like it's coming for us all people who are alive today. Yeah. Um, you've got the BBC that said um, Thwaites, Antarctic glacier heading for dramatic change. And then it says um, there is sufficient ice held upstream to the glacier's drainage basin to raise the height of the oceans by 65 centimetres were it all to melt. And then science, which said ice shelf holding back Antarctic glacier within years of failure. And again, that is the headline. But then paragraph four in the science uh, piece (laughs) says... Uh, a collapse of the entire glacier, which some researchers think is only centuries away, would raise global sea level by 65 centimetres. So you've got to go to paragraph four of the science piece to know that actually all these things, that the 65 centimetres is centuries away. Yeah, well, not, it's actually potentially three... more than 65 centimetres, but, um, but, but the... Um... Well, that must be one glacier, but the whole the whole ice sheet is more. Yeah, but, no, it says but a I think the, key the entire thing glacier. No, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the key thing, Michael, is that um, it, uh, yes, it might. I mean, you know, it probably will take centuries to get all of that because it takes. You know, things happen slowly. Even, in, in, even things that we think are fast are still, you know, are slow. Are still fast in Antarctic terms. Um, but the key thing is that. Um, and what's the sort of more immediate thing is that it may irreversibly be set in process now. That's the key thing is that there might, you know, you can, you're not going to be like some kind of, you know, um, a Dutch dike where you can stick your finger in the hole and try to, once you set in play, you know, in train, um, ch- change on that scale in Antarctica, there's not going to be anything that you could do, that we could do as, you know, a human society to reverse it and that's the bit that could be that is the immediate thing um it you know to actually see the full impact in terms of the 
you know, eventual sea level rise, you know, at the, we don't, there are uncertainties. And as I described, there are these instabilities that might speed up that time scale. And there's an awful lot of research going on at the moment to try and better understand those to see, to get more of an understanding about, you know, exactly, the, you know, a, 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 obviously a key question is how much sea level rise we might see from Antarctica over the, you know, this century. Um, but, uh, but from the, perspective of um you know what's the immediate impact now it's the risk that we will have set this in train and not be able to change it and 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 that's exactly um what we covered with johan rockstrom talking about he calls it the impact time which might be centuries but the commitment time being decades probably much better than i have there you go and well no because your commitment time Look, he hasn't got the OBE for science communication. He's also pretty good at it. But, but you know, you're, you're up there as well, which is why we're talking. But so we've got this kind of, I think you talked about three metres from the Western Antarctic and this one glacier, uh, 65 centimetres. And then it's, but, you know, when you read things like um, the Doomsday Glass, gla- I'm not sure, Glacier or Glacier, what's the house style? I switch yeah. between the two. Gla- the Doomsday Glacier is coming for us all. Then, you know, that is quite clearly not talking about centuries. That is talking about us. It's coming for us all. And, and I think that this is, you know, goes to the heart of the communications challenge, which leads into the heart of the public policy challenge. How do we, um, how do we deal with this kind of, you know, I do think there's one piece out of the Rolling Stone article that I like very much, which is called, talking about the fuse has been blown. Mm. I mean, I would rather call it the fuse has been lit. You know, that the, the, this kind of commitment time, these next few decades, we either light the fuse or we don't light the fuse on something that that probably isn't catastrophic for some centuries, but is then absolutely unstoppable. And how do we communicate that without leading people to be complacent and what is the correct public policy response because my worry is that you see people sort of saying well you know we can't think of it like that because people will become complacent so we have to exaggerate how quickly things are going to happen and of course the problem with that is that you'll misallocate resources to well, no, no, I, I mean I agree with you completely solution. but let's not but let, you know let's not forget that we are seeing the impacts of climate change around the world today in terms of extreme weather so it may be that you know the the antarctica evolves slowly uh, you know there's different there's, the, the, we've got the whole thing together right we can't take one piece of this of this climate <laughs> story without no, but- another piece so you know the antarctic issue is that we you know we could be setting in train um, changes that are effectively irreversible. The extreme weather example, and we've got flooding events happening in the UK right now, um, is that um, we're seeing the impacts of climate change affecting lives and livelihoods around the world today in all parts of the world. So there's, you know, you've got to see the story as a whole. Absolutely. And I agree with that. But, you know, the, the concern with sort of lumping it all together and saying, you know, it's happening. And so we have to, you know, the, the sea level stuff mm. is slightly different because the adaptation that you do for sea level is different from the mitigation and the adaptation that you do for the other stuff. Let me let me just explain what I, what I mean by that. You know, if you believed that that doomsday glacier is coming for us all you know, today, you would, for instance, need right now to start building another Thames barrier, which would subtract the resources that you would have available, perhaps, for other sorts of adaptation against flooding in towns that is caused by runoff from heavier rainfall. So you might do the wrong thing and spend the wrong money if you just kind of you know, oh, no, 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 no. Of course, of course. And actually, that sea level, I mean, that this is another thing... Uh, Climate change is not straightforward, right? <laughs> but you know another thing that's complicated is that so even if we um, you know even if we limit temperature rise to two degrees or or even one point five degrees, um, we'll still continue to see sea level rise for a long time to come. But the timescales of what's happening to temperatures and the timescales of what happens to sea level rise are just different and that's just the nature of the you know of the physics and and all that complexity. Uh, you're right to make informed decisions to make the you know decisions that are based on the best available evidence 
you have to be able to um, effectively communicate that evidence because otherwise it, it, there is a real risk of taking decisions that are maladapting to climate change or um, and potentially ones that could be very, very expensive. Right, and I worry about the maladaptation and the very expensive. I worry that we hmm. um, sort of spend money on things that aren't going to happen for a while and don't focus on the mitigation and the adaptation we need today. And I also worry a lot about something else, which is that um, there are those people who would rather we did not do anything about climate change. Yeah. Um, and I don't use words like denier because I think that's a, I think that's a, in a sense, a bad faith uh, attempt to push them out of the discourse. But there are people who are, let's call them extreme contrarians, right? And um, there are these extreme contrarians. And as soon as they see exaggeration about one thing, be it sea level rise, be it the scenario, this, you know, you and I spoke a little bit at that uh, um, webinar in January, the Christ College webinar about RCP 8.5, the extreme scenario, which is so implausible and yet um, so heavily sort of promoted by climate uh, um, activists and some scientists in parenthesis. Um, my worry is that as soon as you have part of your evidence base or part of your communication resting on something that can't be backed up, it makes it so easy for those bad I mean, faith players what, to push that, back. That's my view. And actually, to go back to the, you know, where we started with this um, Ladybird book, um, one of the uh, criticisms we had from the editor of the uh, Ladybird book was that it was a bit boring because, <laughs> you know, because we were, you know, absolutely just. To, you know, telling the facts as the facts are. Um, and um, the, the editor originally tried to kind of, you know, make it a little bit more flowery, should we say. Um, and, and of course, you know, we were insistent that that it couldn't be like that because I think that we fail, you know, as scientists, we fail society, society if we don't, you know, just convey the evidence as the evidence is as clearly and accurately as we possibly can that's our that's our role um our role as scientists and i you know i personally feel very strongly about this and different people have different different views but my personal view is that we have a a somewhat special role as scientists in the climate debate and it's not to advocate um it's to convey the scientific understanding that we have and we've gathered as accurately as possible and we might as personal citizens have particular political views, but in the context of science communication, that's not our role. Our role is to convey the evidence as clearly as possible. So I, that, that's what I personally always try to do. Um, and, you know, I think it's really important for decision making. That, and it comes down to trust, which is something that you mentioned at some point um, earlier. Um, we, we need, you know, the world needs scientists as trusted communicators. Um, and for that purpose, you want to be confident that those scientists are conveying that information as clearly and in and, and, and as uh, uh, you know, unflowery way as possible, boring though that might be. But, but doesn't then some of what you see around you drive you crazy? I mean, I can give you an example. You may have heard of this, you may not. Professor Michael Mann, poster child for climate science, author of the famous hockey stick chart, who's been um, you know, so controversial. Uh, a few weeks ago, he, he did a television interview where he talked about how climate change, uh, and he lists impacts of storms and fires and, uh, and, and coastal inundation, is already killing more people than COVID, right? Now he's out by two orders of magnitude. COVID has killed somewhere between probably six and 20 million people, huge tragedy uh, globally, and deaths from weather-related natural disasters are, over the last decade have been less than 20,000 a year. And we all know, right, we've just been talking about how, you know, we've lit the fuse on some really bad things and it's not going to get better and we need, we've got the commitment time and we need to act. But when you have a scientist of that stature, that profile, making a statement like that that is so obviously wrong and easily refuted, doesn't it just I make don't know blood whether boil? It's, I don't know. I mean, you know what? I, actually, I think the biggest challenge with that um, statement is that it's really difficult to calculate. 
Um, so, so you could calculate the number of people who've been, um, you know, impacted by extreme weather, um, uh, and that's one way in which you might be able to answer that question: how many people have already been killed? <laughs> it's, it's quite a dramatic way of saying it, isn't it? But let's go. Let's let's run with it. How many people have been killed by climate change to date? <laughs> and you could. <laughs> so, so that's going to be a really difficult calculation because, first of all. We, you know, we can't, as you know, we can't take an extreme weather event and say that was caused by climate change. Nope. We can say the risk of that has but increased. It, but then the other thing is that that, that, that but is. Minute, but, but, the, but the figure that I gave you, less than 20,000, is all people killed by extreme weather, not just the climate well, ones. It's all of them. Well, but 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 um, if you look at heat waves, for example, um, it, so. It, it includes them. You, it, that's the that's the extraordinary thing that it. Well, I don't know how them. you. I don't believe you. I don't believe you. Well, I don't know how you calculate that. I, but, anyway, I, I'm not. Dis, I'm not really disagreeing with you. I'm just that's the that data. That's, that's, that's the data calculate. that has been, you know, reviewed by the IPCC. I mean, that that that. You know, what can I say? <laughs> that's why I say it's out by two orders of magnitude or more because I don't know how accurate it is. But the fact is, we don't have five don't, million. Don't, and the fact there is, is we, there are no five million people killed by a heat wave. It hasn't happened. And, 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 you know, look, I could give plenty of other examples yeah. around the kind of the, 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 the literature around RCP 8.5. And in fact, you know, I want to just move on also from the, the, our role as scientists, because it's not just as scientists. It's also, I believe, our role as parents. So my um, daughter came to me saying she was very upset because the penguins were all going to be functionally extinct by 2100. And she asked me what functionally meant. Uh, and I said, well, there might be a few, but there's not enough for a healthy population. And, and I then said, wait a minute. And I went into the science and discovered that to believe that, you have to believe that the coal industry is going to grow by a factor of 10x by 2100, something that absolutely isn't happen, you know, not going to happen. So I was able to reassure my daughter, but there are people who don't want my daughter reassured. They want her terrified to the point of anxiety uh and mental health issues. I know. And there are also people who, you know, who are who are actively, uh, you know, campaigning on the other side as well. Right. So, I, I mean, I, yes, of course, this whole, you know, if we are to make sensible decisions in the face of, you know, what is a very severe threat to our global society, we need to ensure that those decisions are based on, you know, a hard assessment of the evidence. And some of that evidence is uncertain. So that means, you know, complicated issues about taking decisions in the face of uncertainty. Um, and, and, you know, and within all of that, it's politics in it, <laughs> that there are going to be people who are exaggerating the case on one side and people who are exaggerating the case on the other side. And we've got to kind of navigate through all that noise to try and make the, you know, the most sensible decisions as to how to um, how to respond in the, in, you know, in the face of what, as I say, is a genuine significant threat to, to our society. Uh, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm under no doubt that it's a genuine and significant threat. I mean, I think my last 20 years of my career probably speak for themselves on that. But it's just a kind of a plea, I think, which you share, yeah, that we you, just definitely. have to follow the science. And we can't have one side saying follow the science, but then not following the science themselves. Yeah. That mm -hmm. is not That's not how it works. But this is a fantastic segue into the final topic that I'd love to uh, cover with you to talk to you about. Uh, and that is... Um, uh, Cambridge Zero, you are the director of Cambridge Zero, amongst all the other things that you do. Do you want to talk about what that is? Uh, yes. So I spent a very long time, uh, you know, the last 20 years studying the problem, <laughs> essentially. Um, and I decided it was about time if I was going to keep on, you know, studying the problem uh, to actually look at the solution. <laughs> And essentially, that's what Cambridge Zero, you know, in a, in a, I joke slightly, but essentially that, that, that is what Cambridge Zero is about. So um, we, it's uh, the University of Cambridge's Climate Initiative. It um, spans the entire university and literally everything that the university does and stands for. Um, and it, it's essentially looking at how all that resource and asset can be brought to bear to help support a you know a response to climate change is zero carbon sustainable um, future, and so it's joining up all the research across the university, um, and that means all the science and technology, all our, the social sciences, you know the legal and policy um, expertise. Um, re really importantly, 
understanding the connections with other critical issues, conservation and public health and so forth. Um, and then it's also looking at our educational capacity. So looking at how we um, educate our own students in Cambridge, recognizing that we're essentially um, shaping the leaders of our future here in Cambridge, um, is looking at how we can contribute to school education. We've been talking about that quite a bit uh, over the course of, of today, but you know what the university's role is in terms of helping to shape that, not just in the UK, but uh, globally, looking at how we can um, contribute to post-university education, executive education, or, or more generally adult education. Um, and then looking at all our, um, our, our, I guess our broader influence. So, um, how we communicate widely to everyone, to whether it's policymakers um, about the findings of our research, um, or whether it's about um, engaging, collaborating with industry or about generating some of the solutions, or whether it's about inspiring innovation and entrepreneurship to translate the ideas that are developed in the university on lab benches into real world deployment and scale up across all sectors of the, of the economy. Um, and then it's um, about our own operations and how do we decarbonize the university's estate? How do we decarbonize our operations? How do we stop our academics flying around the world to conferences <laughs> um, and using up carbon emissions? Um, and uh, how, how can we consider, how do we look at our own investments um, and uh, look at that from a sustainability perspective? So as I say, it's across everything. It's not, and it's not just, um, the university itself, it's all the colleges as well. It's a collegiate university activity. So Christ College, which is again where we started this conversation, um, is very much part of um, that initiative. But so are um, the other um, parts of the university. So Cambridge University Press and Assessment, for example, when we're looking at the education aspect of it, we're working very much with Cambridge University Press and Assessment um, to see how we can take that to a global audience. So it's really you know, it's it's really exciting. And what makes it distinctly different to what I think any other university is doing, quite a number of globally leading universities have in recent years set up climate schools as sort of, you know, siloed activities. And, and we've just done it differently. So we've centred this right in the centre of the university spanning everything. And and do you have a secretariat? Do you have a team? Or is it is it a kind of a big matrix with you at the, at the heart of it? But... <laughs> Um, there's a um, there's a core team, but it's you know about as I say the, the 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 purpose of it is really to enable everything else across the university. So um, it's a very lean operation because we're what we're doing is we're just essentially unlocking and connecting up yeah. everything that already exists and creating um, you know somewhat of a common purpose in terms of the research. I mean, a really key thing that we're able to that we, we know we're starting to be able to do now is take a much more systems-based approach to many of the key issues. So there's a big pro project that we've just um, launched uh, earlier this week, uh, which is looking at um, sustainable land regeneration. So um, one, uh, one of the areas that we're looking at is local to Cambridge, um, which is all, you know, there's a lot of fenland around Cambridge, um, uh, which is all peat, drained peatland. And um, it's very uh, uh, actively farmed at the moment. And the challenge is that um, the peat is degrading. It's releasing large amounts of carbon emissions uh, across the whole of the UK, something like uh, uh, up to four to five percent of UK emissions come from peatlands. So it's uh, a critical um, to understand how we can manage that land, but manage it in a way that has a climate benefit, a benefit to nature. Um, and also a benefit, a, a social benefit as well, because there are people, you no, know, it is a, a currently a really significant part of the local economy. So we're trying to look at a very holistic way at, at all those issues, working with the local farming community, the conservation groups, bringing in a very broad range of scientific expertise to, to, to assess the, the problem, as well as the social sciences to understand the, the social context to all of this. Very good, very good. And I'll tell you an, a, just a little anecdote from when I, before I started New Energy Finance, I sort of dived into fuel cells because mm -hmm. it was one of the 
you know, every 20 years, there's a sort of bubble of, you know, hype around hydrogen or a, a, a period of hype. Not all of it is hype today, but a lot of it is. Um, but it was the last cycle. And so I went up to Cambridge because I am an alum. And I, um, I found that there were professors working on fuel cells in engineering, in chemistry, in the physics department. But then, of course, there were some sort of systems thinking around um, energy systems that were in the management uh, 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 groups and so on. Uh, and they were all working. None of them were working collegially with each other. And no, in no, fact, no. Exactly. When I, when I, worse than that, when I went to talk to them, they spent most of their time not talking about the, the fabulous work that they were doing or the global importance of the solutions. They spent most of the time actually bad mouthing each other. No, oh, but but uh, but exactly. So so there was a huge amount of research that was going on in Cambridge, but it was all in little pockets. And what we've been able to do is 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 join that together. And uh, it, you know, I feel like. Uh, well, actually, no, I, I used the word privileged uh, about how I felt going to um, Antarctica. I, I feel really privileged to be able to to, to do this role in Cambridge because it is an incredible resource that we have. And by bringing it together, I, I honestly think that we can make a really valuable global contribution because we can start to really set some of the key thinking that will shape the solutions of, of the future. Um, and it and it and it you know it's by not letting it live in tiny pockets that are not talking to each other, but by bringing that together, so that you can have you know you need those people to challenge each other robustly to understand where the you know where the where where the flaws in their arguments are to make sure that we are coming back to our earlier conversation that we are robustly challenging the evidence to create the evidence base that's necessary for making sensible decision making whether it's on hydrogen or any other aspect of the of the you know the response to climate change i i've actually got a final final question yes. which i also don't want to miss which is <laughs> um around um getting women into science right you're mm -hmm. very eminent very successful uh i know that you've done quite a bit in this area but i don't know whether it's sort of within the cambridge zero under that framework or or, or more generally the question would be if science is going to be more obviously focused on solving sort of big existential problems like climate change, you know, is that going to make it easier to get girls into science? Is that making it easier um, or, or is that irrelevant? Am I just sort of barking up a completely uh, irrelevant tree? Well, now, I mean, first of all, if if science is going to be addressing, you know, problems that address the whole of humanity, then we really ought to be having representatives of the whole of humanity as being part of developing those solutions. Right. Um, so that is the first you know, you know, point to make there. Um, is it a topic that um, attracts more um, women to the to the topic? Um, uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I would like to think that. Um, in a way that's not been um i'm not i'm not sure that there are there may be topics in which women are traditionally much more represented than others and you know i've been working through mathematics i'm now based in a computer science department these are not um uh, topics that traditionally have had a, a large number of um, men, I'm not sure that there's anything intrinsic about the topics themselves that make them unattractive to women. I think there's been lots of other barriers that have been in place, um, which I hope uh, we are starting to break down. And and some of it is, you know, I you know I can say from my own experience that there have been many times in my career. Actually, Antarctica is another one. So I've done, a, I've almost got, you know, a full house of places where there's not been many women involved. Um, it was a long time when I, um, women weren't even allowed to do uh, to go to overwinter in in Antarctica. Um, but uh, the, uh, you know, I like to think that we're slowly making progress by not least by having prominent women and creating an environment where. It's uh, it's not the subject that's not attractive. It's the environment that's sometimes not attractive for, for, for women to be working in. And I hope we're starting to change that. I very much hope so as well. In fact, one of our previous guests, Baroness Brown, Julia King, mm. uh, was on the show talking about uh, her sort of time as a pioneering engineering uh, engineer and one of the first women to, to, to tread that path. Um, so it's a it's a, 
uh, it could not. I think you said it exactly that we're not going to solve the most wicked problems in the world drawing on a small gene pool of only part of the population. You said it exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and it's true of other. You know, it's not just about getting more women into the subject. It's about getting you know that full range of diversity in, into the subject as well. Absolutely. And on that note, I agree entirely. And on that note, I'm afraid uh, we are out of time. But I want to thank you for joining us uh, here today on Cleaning Up. Oh, no, it's my pleasure. Thank you. My guest next week on Cleaning Up is Rianne Marie Thomas, CEO of the Green Finance Institute. Please join me at this time next week for a conversation with Rianne Marie Thomas. Cleaning Up is brought to you by the Liebreich Foundation and the Gilardini Foundation.